Welcome back to episode five or six. I've lost track. <laughs> a professor yeah, and the idiot. It's a good thing we've lost track. That means we're putting in work. Yep, yep, yep. So what's on your mind, Dalton? You know, obviously, if you're a person who has stayed at Nick's house, you realize the collection of books that he has in his house. And you see kind of a theme, and communism, Russian Revolution is a big part of his collection. So I assume he has a vast knowledge on the subject and something that has affected so much of the 20th century is so important to us today. I would like to hear his opinions and knowledge on the subject. That's a pretty broad mandate, Dalton, but I'll do what I can. I think you're up for it. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm fascinated. What is this ideology that resulted in more deaths in the 20th century than any idea ever had from the millions of people that Stalin starved to death, mostly in the Ukraine in the 1930s, what's called the Holodomor or horror famine? Then, later in the 1950s, Mao in China, also in the name of communism, starved to death even more people in his so-called Grape Leaf Forward. In both cases, individual farmers were forced onto collective farms. They didn't work. Grain was requisitioned by the federal government, and tens of millions of people perished. I feel like that's something that's not talked about enough. No, no. And one reason it isn't talked about as much as the Holocaust, say, is it just doesn't have that cold, calculated, chilling idea of people being forced into death chambers and poisoned with gas. Yeah, um, the little bit of research I did on this was the idea of the superior race maybe wasn't behind it and that 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 idea is i don't know more uh, affects people in a different way maybe communists weren't believers in the in the um superior race they were believers in the superior social class the proletariat the workers versus the owners. So class was to the communists as race was to the Nazis. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where to start? This may almost be too too broad a question. Well, I guess where does the ideology start? It begins with Karl Marx, would you say? I, I think that's a good enough place to start. Certainly we can see, if we look through the literature earlier works talking about human emancipation, talking about freedom from tyranny, but Karl Marx redefined these ideas. He separated the world into two classes of people, those who owned the means of production, those who owned business and capital, and those who worked. And those who worked, according to Marx, were alienated from the product of their labor power. They did the work, but the owners got the reward. And Karl Marx saw this as being inherently unfair and called for the overthrow of the owners in the name of the workers. Now, if I remember right, I, you know, I took a philosophy 101 class at Salt Lake Community College, and my professor actually was born in the Soviet Union and uh, studied in primarily French philosophy, but all things philosophy. Karl Marx never was a worker. (laughs) Is is that correct? Like a laborer, like you might think? No. uh, You know, I don't know all the history, so I don't know if he spent a little time as a worker, but my understanding is he was from a middle class family and spent most of his life writing and having wealthy patrons who supported his writing okay yeah that's kind of the point i was getting at is this guy basically never worked a legitimate job 
or not, I wouldn't say legitimate. Okay, I'll change that. Uh, never worked a laborious job. I'm not sure if that's relevant. Or we should hold that against him. Well, I feel like if you're arguing for the workers, you should kind of know how it is to be one. But I don't think personal experience should always be required to make an argument. No, I don't yeah, think it should yeah. be required. Yeah. But I, don't know. I mean, it might have given him more credibility at the time, but I'm hostile to the notion that personal experience should be required to be an expert in anything. Certainly, it lends a valuable perspective, but it shouldn't be a prerequisite. No, I, I, I agree with okay. you there, but um, I don't know. The idea that the goth godfather of philosophy as arguing for the worker, the laborer, never probably probably never picked up a shovel and right. worked a couple of months. <laughs> I don't think it's accurate to say he's the godfather of philosophy. We could look at people like Plato for that. Well, no, no, not the godfather of philosophy, the godfather of philosophy. Of, are, are of communism, for... yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I become more interested when Marxism is put into practice in a meaningful way in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, and there had been... You... Oh, oh, sorry. Go, no, I, go, ahead, go ahead. I mean, certainly this wasn't the first case of overthrow of the rulers by the masses. A hundred years before Marx was writing, we had had the French Revolution. During the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 1871, encircled Paris, uh, had workers set up a commune in there, which Marx later wrote about. So there were certainly earlier attempts at revolutionary movements, but I think Marx's ideas were first most fully realized in the Russian Revolution, which occurred in 1917. Now, Marx was German, am I correct? Yes. And he lived in Britain for a little while? Yeah, I mean, he moved to country, from country to country because no country wanted someone writing such subversive work, so he was expelled more than once. Okay, now how did the Russians attach on to that? Is there any background to that? Starting in the late 1800s, there were various Russian revolutionaries, and some were communists, some were more anarchists. But they were all operating abroad because Russia at this point was a, was a pretty authoritarian country. And the Russian police would frequently exile to Siberia or deport people engaged in revolutionary activity or writing. Okay. In 1905, when Russia was in the process of losing the, their war with Japan, was the first attempt at revolution. And Leon Trotsky, who was later to be such a prominent part of the Soviet government figured prominently in this attempt at revolution. And ultimately, it subsided with the Russian government making various promises. The Tsar created a parliament and various other concessions to the revolutionaries. So Trotsky later viewed this 1905 revolution as a dress rehearsal for the real revolution. What do you mean dress dress rehearsal? It was a practice revolution. How can, it, how can you have a practice revolution? You can have a revolution that doesn't fully succeed, but then you have practice in mobilizing and getting people to march. Okay. In, orga in organizing for a revolution. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So, in 1917 was the third year of World War I for all the European powers, England, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia, and others. And Russia at this point was a country with a fairly large economy, it had the sixth largest economy in the world, but it already had experienced huge losses, millions of men in World War I. And despite being a fairly advanced economy, 
Russia had a very old-fashioned political system. It still had an absolute monarchy, and monarchy typically meant inefficiency. And in St. Petersburg, which had been named Petrograd, riots broke out over a lack of food. And normally, when riots had ever broken out in Russia, the government quickly suppressed them with troops. But this time, the troops said, eh, we're not going to do anything. And so the government troops mingled with the protesters. Probably because they're either short on food or people they know very closely yep, are short yep. on food. Yeah, they had simply lost any confidence in the Russian government and the Russian czar. And so at this point, the chief of the Russian army contacted all the heads of the different fronts Russia was fighting on and produced a letter showing they had no confidence in the czar and that he should retire. So I'm simplifying a lot of complicated history, but this led to the czar abdicating. He just stepped off the throne. And suddenly Russia, which had been an absolute monarchy for hundreds of years, had no ruler. So when he steps off the throne, what does he do? What does he do? He returns to St. Petersburg, where his family is, and is initially placed under house arrest in one of his castles near St. Petersburg. So he's still protected, and it's not like how some leaders are dealt with when a revolution happens right. where they're killed savagely. Yeah, that hap- that happens in a year, but for now oh. he's for now he's still treated well. Okay. Uh, so what's going to happen? Who's going to be the government? Well, there are a lot of people at this point making claims that they're the legitimate government of Russia. But ultimately, basically two powers arise. The first is a government called the Provisional Government, comprised of ministers from the old parliament. And suddenly they have full power. But at the same time, a collective of workers, known in Russia as a Soviet, also arises, and they also claim to have power. For the next six months, Russia is ruled very unstably by these competing power centers. And are, are they still involved in World War One? Yep, they're point? still fighting in World War One. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is a very chaotic time in Russia, but it's an encouraging time. That provisional government included many people who were genuinely liberal Democrats who wanted a society like England or France, but its leaders were ultimately incompetent, especially the man who came to run it, Alexander Kerensky. That happened in February, according to the Russian calendar at the time. Uh, So then, in April, Lenin, the head of the Bolshevik party, returns from exile to Russia. The story of how he returns is famous, and books have been written upon it. And he returned because Germany arranged for it on what's been called a sealed train. Namely, Germany wanted Lenin to return to Russia because he knew that Lenin was a revolutionary and would cause upheaval and instability in Russia. Now, what was Lenin exiled for? For being, a, for being a, a Marxist, for being a revolutionary, for preaching overthrow of the Tsar. Okay. And so he returns to Russia on a so-called seal train, a train that had special extra judicial legal properties through Germany to Finland, where he could then catch another train to Russia. In other words, Germany was sabotaging Russia's war effort by sending a revolutionary he knew would create chaos in Russia. Okay. So Winston Churchill has marvelous prose about this. He says, World War I gave us the machine gun, the flamethrower, but the Germans invented the most deadly weapon of all. Like a, like a bacteria, they, they injected one into Russia. <laughs> I mean, his, his language is, even, is more, even more colorful. So Lenin comes to Russia, and he instantly organizes for a coup to overthrow the provisional government and seize power. 
And after two attempts and a lot of incompetence by the provisional government, in the October Revolution, Lenin and his band of revolutionaries seized power. So this was a coup. This was not a popular uprising. This was a coup against a government that had at least some democratic legitimacy and was only governing until a constituent assembly could happen. In other words, a national assembly that would decide how Russia was to be ruled. Hmm. So you know, I always wonder with yeah. uh, history like this is like without internet and you know a lot of the modern technology is like how does somebody organize something like this? Right, with letters, with telegrams, with messengers, and much more slowly. When the Tsar was overthrown in Russia, Russia is an enormous country occupying 10 time zones. and It extends all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Some of those interior provinces took a long time to learn. Okay. So most of the action happened in the two big cities in European Russia, in St. Petersburg, which at the time was the capital, and Moscow, which became the capital early in 1918. This is a tragedy for history. Russia had a moment to become a democracy, but they had no history of democracy. And many who had the chance to guide it into democracy in 1917 just fucked up. (laughs) They were on the verge of becoming something somewhat modern and uh, moderate in their government, but Lenin kind of spoiled it all. Yep, Lenin seized power. And so, while most of the country, including the military, was ready, instantly recognized the provisional government that took power after the Tsar was overthrown, they did not recognize Lenin. And a brutal civil war broke out that lasted three years, that killed over nine million people, including combat deaths and starvation and disease. The Civil War is fascinating because 11 foreign countries intervened in it against the communists, including the United States, England, and France. But the interventions were all confused, and they were not well coordinated, and so they could have acted decisively to overthrow the, the communists, but World War I ended in 1918, and there was not will for too much additional fighting. Well, so, so did... Uh... Russia withdraw from World War One before World War One ended. Yes, exactly. That's what Lenin's program was. He instantly sought an armistice because he realized if Russian troops were still fighting the Germans, he wouldn't be able to defend his revolution. Okay. Early in eighteen, after almost comical negotiations, he signed a treaty with. Germany, called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, named after the city in which the treaty was signed, which gave away huge amounts of Russian territory to the Germans. Did he do that just to get the Germans off his back? Yep, 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 yep. He ultimately got that territory back anyhow a few months later after Germany was defeated in World War One. Yeah, because they were crippled. Yep, yep, yep. This enabled him to consolidate his control and fight the Civil War, which he ultimately won. I'm always fascinated with how one person is the head of something like this. Yep. yep. Like you, you, like when you view yourself as a human being, it's like, oh, I have so little influence or I'm just one person, but then you read throughout history how one person can have so much influence that creates a snowball effect for the rest of history. Yep, yep. Yep, it's amazing. But Lenin was a professional revolutionary. He had been preparing for this moment for decades. Still, he said, not long before the first Russian Revolution, he said he did not expect to see it in his lifetime, and so was amazed when the Tsar abdicated and gave up the throne. Hmm. I should note that the Tsar did what he thought was right for his country, But he didn't have to do that. He could have said, no, I'm not abdicating. And I used troops at the front who are still loyal to crush the revolution. Hmm. Who knows how that would have turned out in retrospect, but he did it because he thought it was the best best thing for his country.
So, Renan had been preparing for this moment for a long time. One important lesson to take away is that communism has never been a democratic form of government, and the most ruthless person will always take charge. And that's how, after Lenin died in 1924, how Stalin seized power. He outmaneuvered all of his rivals at the time, ultimately had them all killed, <laughs> and seized power. That's why communist governments can never be trusted not to perpetrate the kind of horrors that Stalin did in the 1930s with the starvation in the famine and more. Stalin periodically killed groups of people for the rest of his life. So with communism, the government owns everything? Is that yes, the yes. So just the difference between communism and socialism is that communism is both a political system and an economic system. Socialism is just an economic system. Socialism doesn't say anything about the kind of government you have. Okay. <sighs> It's very weird to me that revolutionaries and people that are fighting against a oppressive, powerful system say, "Let's give all the power to the government," because <laughs> it, you know it just it just doesn't make sense to me. Because it's like, who are the people you're going to be putting in power, and what about the people after that, and after that, and after that? Yep. How can you trust them? Yep, especially since they. The succeeding leaders will not be chosen democratically. Now, Lenin claimed to be acting in the name of the people, but his interpretation of Marxism is that the workers require a vanguard to seize power and achieve communism. So the workers uprise and violently? Yes, except it's not really the workers. It's Lenin and his cohorts acting on behalf of the workers. Prior to Lenin seizing power, only a minority of Russians were Bolsheviks, that is, belonged to Lenin's political party. Others were socialists of a more moderate variety, Mensheviks, who believed in a transition to socialism through the ballot box. There were all different kinds of socialists. There were a few liberal democrats. There were some constitutional monarchs who wanted to have a system like England, but still have a czar. There were some authoritarians on the right. So it's kind of a clusterfuck in Russia at this point. It was an enormous clusterfuck. But Lenin's party was the best organized and the most ruthless, the most willing to kill people to achieve their aim. And Stalin was a part of this. He, was he running with Lenin at this point? Yes. So Stalin had a small role in the 1917 seizure of power. In Lenin's first government, Stalin's job was commissar, that is, minister of nationalities, because Russia was a huge country, which included not only Russians, but Ukrainians, Chechens, Georgians, and so Stalin's role was to figure out how to incorporate all those people into the so new Soviet government. Okay. He was not a major player in the Russian Revolution. The head was Lenin. The person who was next most responsible was Leon Trotsky. Both Trotsky returned to Russia to help lead the revolution. He was actually in New York at the time, of all places. Stalin was in exile in Siberia, and he returned after the Tsar was overthrown. Trotsky, Stalin saw, was his main rival for power, and he eventually managed to have Trotsky exiled and then murdered in Mexico in 1940 with an ice pick to the dome. Yeah, yeah. Listen to a podcast a month or two ago, and they talked about Trotsky, and it was pretty incredible to hear that they went all the way to Mexico yep. to murder this guy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Stalin's trail of blood and victims is international. One of Trotsky's sons was killed in Paris in the 1930s. Wow. After the Bolsheviks won the Civil War... The other side, the whites, many of them who could escape Russia did escape. And so twice 
in the 1930s, the Soviet government kidnapped leaders of the whites in exile. They kidnapped a General Kutepov, I believe his name was, from Paris in 1930, and a General Miller in 1937. In both cases, they just disappeared from those countries, were smuggled back to Russia and executed. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Stalin is famous being bloodthirsty, but his foreign minister and longtime aide, I can't pronounce his first name, but Molotov, who lived a very long time and only died in the late 1980s, he was interviewed in the 70s about Lenin and Stalin. And he said, oh no, Stalin was a pussycat compared to Lenin. Wow. <laughs> yeah. A pussycat. Yes. I mean, I, I can't even imagine that difference can be possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These people are killers, and that's how they attained their communism. So too is Mao. So too is perhaps the most extreme version of communism ever created in Cambodia in 1975 by the Khmer Rouge. In their four years of power, they executed one quarter of the population of Cambodia. Two million people out of eight million people. Wow, that's... Yeah. Sometimes it's a little less bloody, like the Castro brothers in Cuba, where certainly they have imprisoned or executed some dissidents, but they haven't committed genocide like Stalin and Mao and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia did. Still a police state. I visited Cuba about six years ago. We can talk about it in another pod. It was very interesting. Yeah, let's see. Actually, I've been to Russia too, for that matter. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, fascinating. Why do you think Karl Marx didn't... Did he advocate for a violent overthrow and such ferociousness, I guess you could put it? I, his language, some, some of it was dramatic. You know, he talked about seizing power. But no, I don't... He did not detail the need for wholesale slaughter of millions of people. So sociopaths found this literature and latched onto it and get, it gave them a, a reason. Well, yeah, only sociopaths were able to actually put communism into practice. Yeah, that seems to be the case. <laughs> yes. Okay. I guess we should ask the question of, did it work? Did Lenin and Stalin and their successors manage to create a paradise for workers? Uh, I would say no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. as uneducated as I am, I know that did not happen. No, it really did not happen. Now, they did manage to create a pretty equal society, but... Everybody's equally poor and starving. Yes, everyone's equally poor. Let's talk about what that looked like in practice. One common description of the Soviet Union was Ghana with rockets, where they poured all their money in the military in competition with America, and by the 1970s had nuclear parity with America and the ability to intervene in proxy wars in the third world. But the people were always poor, and this is the vast majority of the people. And by poor, I mean there was a 10-year wait to get a telephone. Holy shit. <laughs> yes. Very few people had private cars. That was a rare luxury. A quarter of hospitals didn't have running water. Jesus. And this was an economy that was not competitive in any way. It was a command economy with the federal government issuing goals for production. This produced poverty. This economy didn't work. So some, perhaps my favorite example is a chandelier factory that had quotas measured by weight and how many chandeliers it produced. The result was it produced chandeliers so heavy that they collapsed ceilings. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Everything in Russia was shitty. Standards of living were poor. Everyone waited in lines all the time for food, for clothing. Almost everything was poorly made. It was not a paradise. People could always get jobs. They could always have a roof over their heads. Communism meant the price of housing 
in Moscow did not change between the 1930s and the 1980s, which is wow. amazing. Which is amazing. That's what a command economy achieved, but it also achieved a shitty standard of living. And so, Russian leaders, when the first one to travel to the West was Nikita Khrushchev, who succeeded Stalin in the 1950s, were just blown away when they walked into a gro- an American grocery store. I bet they were. Yeah. And But no incentive to change. There was some incentive. So Khrushchev, after Stalin, was the first one who tried to moderate communism and make it more humane. He gave his famous secret speech in 1956 in which he admitted that Stalin had been a monster, decried the cult of personality... And so many Russians didn't learn about the secret speech, but everyone in the West did. That was the moment in which people who were still in the West, in America and England and France and Germany, who were still fooled by communism, who still thought it might work, most of them, all of them with any brains, quit after the secret speech. Like my cousin Alan. <laughs> they really, there was no... No more wonder of if it worked or not, yeah, or yeah. if it could go horribly bad yeah. like it did. Yeah, so that's what the secret speech did. Yeah, my cousin Alan, who died about five years ago, was a communist in the 40s and the 50s, until he realized what it had created. Khrushchev tried to produce a more humane society, very slowly. He lifted restrictions on censorship, the famous novel by Solzhenitsyn, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which just chronicled the day in the gulag and the Soviet prisons, was published during that period. I read it in high school or before. You should all read it. It's a really good short novel. Okay. But, but in 1964, Khrushchev was overthrown in a coup, and then paralysis set in again until 1985 when Gorbachev took power. And Gorbachev realized that the country was sick and the economy was failing. Indeed, in the 1980s, Russia had to import grain from the West to keep its people from starving, which is amazing. A country that had so much fertile land in the Ukraine couldn't feed its own people. Yeah, that's... uh, It's tough to hear because the people who aren't in power are suffering the most. Gorbachev introduced liberalizations to the system, known as glasnost and perestroika. He lifted censorship, he provided the rudiments of market competition, and once the society was opened, he couldn't control it. And it, as I'm sure a lot of you know, fell apart within six years. Yeah. Um, My philosophy teacher, he talked about the black market economy, Yes. How, and, and he was an older, he had to be at least 55, maybe 60 years old. Talked about how he had to buy a, Be- a Beatles record illegally. Yep. <laughs> um, and I, it was one of the most impactful classes I've ever had to listen to a man who grew up in the Soviet Union. Not Russia, the Soviet Union. Yes. Talk about Karl Marx and his bad ideas, and and he wasn't harsh. He wasn't you was very calculated, and he wasn't emotional about it. Yeah. But listening to a guy who's lived through that was so powerful to hear. Um, I can when, imagine. And when I asked him, I was like, "What do you think of America?" And he just said, "I like America. I, like I I really do love America." It, I mean. It was one of the most impactful classes I've ever had. I can see that. There is a unique form of gratitude among refugees from communist countries. Yeah. We've covered a lot of history so far. Where do you want to go with this? Why do you think communism... And I I don't know how you feel about socialism. I know you lean to the left, but you're also, as you've said before in past episodes, you're a, a capitalist... Um, obviously it seems to me socialism is a step down from communism what do you think about socialism and how it leads if it can or does lead to communism what do you think about that progression 
First of all, I would say there has never been a socialist country. There are none today. There's never been one. I don't see a progression. Okay. Certainly, there's been more talk about socialism in the last few years, and it's a really an amazing amount of talk about of socialism. Where did that come from? I think a couple of places. First, for years, some of Obama's foes, Green. he was a socialist. Yes. And so that is not new for conservatives in America. For example, in the early 1960s, Ronald Reagan, before he became a politician, was issuing dire warnings that if we instituted Medicare in America, that would take us down the path to socialism. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And before that, people thought the New Deal, in other words, any modest government interventions in the economy would take us to socialism. And, you know, history shows that Reagan was wrong, and there is no evidence whatsoever that Obama's a socialist. Bernie Sanders seems to be the latest figure when it comes to the topic of socialist. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I know you've kind of downplayed a lot of what the right likes to portray yeah. him as. Yeah. As I've heard you say in the past, he's basically just... Basically, Obama's politics plus a little bit extra. Yes, I mean, he is a capitalist. He does not want a command economy, but he wants capitalism of the kind that's practiced in Northern Europe. We have more regulation on big business in the financial sector and a bigger welfare state. Okay. The most obvious example, something we've heard a lot about recently, is, is the expansion of Medicaid to all Americans, or Medicare. Now, this is a very small, tiny, tiny example, but I don't know if that's how a lot of fans of Bernie Sanders view him as a capitalist. I've heard at least this is one example, literally one example, but something tells me it might transfer to a lot more people, but... They supported Bernie Sanders, and then I've heard that same person also say, I wouldn't mind if America became socialist. <laughs> now, this person is very uneducated when it comes to politics, but is also not dogmatic. But I think a lot of people – okay, I'll change that. I think some people might view Bernie Sanders – as equal to socialism type ideas. Right. He's not. And Alexandra Ocasio is not. They claim to be democratic socialists, but that's just capitalism with a welfare state. And it's certainly true now that a surprisingly large number of young people are more enthusiastic about socialism and less enthusiastic about communism. But I have to believe that the vast majority of them just want Scandinavian capitalism. That is, a larger social safety net and more regulation of Wall Street. And they don't want Stalinist death camps. Yeah. In other I mean, words, yeah. yeah. I, I I haven't heard anybody that wants anything like that. <laughs> now, anyone who wants communism is an uneducated idiot. I agree with you on that. <laughs> the libertarian total control of the state is the worst nightmare imaginable. Yep, and it just doesn't work. It's never worked. The Soviet Union was a piss-poor country. China was a piss-poor country until uh, Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy after Mao died. Cuba is a piss-poor country. I don't know if there's an episode where we should talk more about this, but here's one, one thing that happened to me in Cuba when I was there in uh, 2012. I was at a resort and in the ocean when a guy swims up to me. He doesn't speak very good English, but we start talking, and he tells me he's a school teacher. And then he asks me if I have any soap I can spare. Those two things should not be related. <laughs> well, yes. This is something I heard often, that people there couldn't get soap. Now, uh, How much is that? Uh, you know, I know America shut off trade to Cuba. Yeah, yeah. How much is that Americans' policy and just communist policy? 
I think certainly the American trade embargo has hurt Cuba. But that having been said, that shouldn't stop them from being able to get enough soap. Yeah. Educated professionals in Cuba, like doctors, eat meat once a month because that's all they can afford. Ugh. Now, a lot of vegetarians and vegans would be like, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but most people aren't vegetarians and vegans. I read an article about Cuban weightlifters, and it talked about them only focusing on their upper body just because they couldn't afford enough protein. Wow. Makes you wonder how guys like Yo Romero and wrestlers succeeded. In states like China and Cuba, one thing they do do well is produce athletes because the government can look at young people and see who the good athletes are. And those who are going to be star athletes are identified when they're young and they get special training and special food. Right. So they get meat uh, yeah, yeah. more than once a month. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Yeah, certainly communist countries did have small elite classes, right? And that includes people who are going to be athletes who are internationally competitive. Hmm. It, it is nice to hear that you talk about Bernie Sanders and Scandinavian com- or countries like that. Because I think a lot of, you know, that's why we're doing this podcast, to educate people and people like me. A lot of people think that those countries, like, they got to figure it out. They, I don't, I don't know how to phrase it. I guess uh, tamed the demon that is capitalism and learn how to tame it and use it correctly. There's questions about whether those countries are comparable to America because they're smaller. Many of them are more homogenous. People are all more similar than America, but certainly those countries enjoy a high standard of living, better life expectancy and so forth. So with the communism, it never seems to go well or end no. well for that, for that matter. How did... I've never really heard anybody break down how the collapse of the Soviet Union went. I know when you said, I forget the name of the president or leader, dictator guy of yeah. the Soviet Union, when he started to allow less regulations and such harsh controls that it just opened the floodgates and within, I think he said six years. Yes. It was, it was all over. Yes. How did that happen? How, how did the end happen? Was it violent? Chaos. In Russia, the chaos came after. So here's what happened in the early eighties. In about three years, there were three different leaders of the Soviet Union. Leonid Brezhnev died in the end of 1982. He was replaced by Yuri Andropov, who died 14 months later, who was replaced by Konstantin Chernyenko, who died a year later. So in the space of under three years, there were three leaders. All three were old men. The next in line was Mikhail Gorbachev, who was younger and saw how fucked up the country was, how fucked up the economy was. And so he tried to modernize it with his two policies known in the uh, by Russian words, glasnost and perestroika. One means openness. I can't remember the exact translation of the other one. But what this meant was more democracy, less censorship, more opportunities for individual initiative. And within six years, the whole thing had collapsed. Perhaps what precipitated the collapse, which occurred at the end of 1991, was an attempted coup in August of 1991 by hardliners who saw that the new openness was threatening the stability of the country and tried to overthrow Gorbachev and return to the old ways. But the coup was poorly organized and collapsed, and there was tremendous popular support against the coup that you know hastened its demise. And so it really ended with a whimper. The Soviet Union was a large multi-ethnic country, and it became about 15 countries, of which Russia was just the largest. So when it became 15 countries, was that 
going back to what the countries were before? Like, how was that figured out? Yes. All of them had been countries at one point in time, but they had all been conquered by Russia, mostly in the 19th century. Some had experienced multiple occupations in the 20th century. For example, the three Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, had been part of Russia. Then after the Russian Revolution had won their independence and were independent countries for 20 years, then were occupied first by the Nazis. Some of them were occupied first by the Nazis. Others were occupied by the Soviets during World War II, then occupied by the Nazis, then liberated by the Soviets. So they'd experienced a lot of upheaval, and of course, each time a bunch of people were killed. And finally, those countries attained independence in 1991. Others had somewhat less conflicted 20th century histories, but were still former countries that had independence or at least a national identity. Hmm. So what happens after 1991? Who's in charge? How is, is there a constitution? Is there guidelines? Okay. Elections? It, yes. In 1990, Boris Yeltsin was elected as president of Russia. And then when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, he became the first president of independent Russia. And the 1990s were a time of more freedom and openness in Russia, but also chaos. Remember, the state owned all, owned the entire economy, and that had to be privatized. And that ended up happening in a chaotic, corrupt way that allowed a few people to seize most of the wealth. Yeah, because if the state owns everything, yeah. and then all of a sudden the state is no more, then who takes ownership of everything? Chaos, right? <laughs> Chaos. Is that this when the Russian mob basically takes over it doesn't take over but it certainly gains a lot of money and power during the 1990s okay now note that this process happened differently in all the 15 countries that used to be the soviet union some instantly became dictatorships ruled by the soviet governor at the time and some have become really oppressive dictatorships some like the, the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, become democracies that are more stable and indeed join NATO and become you know successful democracies. Now, why those countries were more European? They had a more recent history of democracy. So I, the reasons are too complex to get into here, but a few, especially those countries do well. Some of them do well abysmally and just remain really repressive dictatorships somewhere in the middle okay as for the standard of living in russia it started to fall many people missed the low guaranteed standard of living of the soviet union life expectancy fell uh in the 1990s it declined to about 59 for men which is really terrible in 2000 boris yeltsin appointed as or, or anointed, I guess is a better word, Putin as his successor and hoped that Putin would continue to try to take the country in a democratic and open direction, but that didn't happen. Um, now, I, I just listened to the book uh, Animal Farm by Orwell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great uh, book. On, on Friday. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that fascinated me the most is – as time went on, people yes. forgot the original message, and then yes. it just became a normal part of life on the farm. Yes. Is that basically what happened with the Soviet Union is people, the, all the propaganda and the iron fist of the state, eventually people just like, oh, this is normal. And that's why there was no major uprising or revolting against such poor conditions. People don't always rebel, especially when the state is so oppressive, especially when everyone is an informer for the government and anyone has the ability to rat you out and throw you in jail. Revolution doesn't always happen. Yeah, it's, it's like you get brownie points for ratting people out. Yep. 
Yep. I think the most telling moment uh, I experienced there was when I was in Cuba and I got into a cab and the driver said, welcome to Cuba. Nine million people, five million secret police. Yep, basically. Yeah, I mean, he really captured it well. In China, which had been, had a closed backwards economy it was Mao's successor Deng Xiaoping who realized that the country would have to, I mean a modern economy to survive and thrive so he introduced market reforms starting in the 1980s and that's why over a billion fewer people live in poverty even than 30 or 40 years ago wow oh, it's just so sad that so many people had to live through such terrible conditions and it, it also amazes me how powerful ideas are and the right quote, the sword is mightier or i mean the pen is mightier than the sword yeah. man it's it's incredible how quickly things can go so well or so bad for people just because of ideas yeah it is but i think i would not exaggerate the strength of ideas because at least in the Soviet Union and really in every country, communism never had the support of the majority of the people. It was always enforced at gunpoint. It was only some people in the West who had a mistaken infatuation with the idea. Oh, so it was the sociopaths with the guns yeah. <laughs> that enforced this up upon the majority. Yes, yes. I'm sure there were there were some true believers. Indeed, there were some true believers among the Bolsheviks who took power in 1917. The Bolshevik Alexander Kolontai, who was appointed the minister of uh, social welfare in 1917, had progressive ideas about equality between the sexes and was even a believer in free love, but she didn't last long in the cabinet. Hmm. So certainly there were some true believers, but true believers tended to be killed by the more ruthless and more pragmatic authoritarians. Yeah, just like in the book Animal Farm, it's the sociopathic leader changes the rules. Yep. And, the, and it just morphs the original idea because yep. the original idea doesn't jive with what the current person wants. Yep. Look at the fate of Boxer the Horse in Animal Farm. Yep. Yeah. He was a true believer, and they sent him to the glue factory, literally. Yep. Yeah, and no pensions, and they didn't care, and it's like an assembly line, oh, this person, or, yeah, this person's out. Bring in the next one. In the Soviet Union, if you didn't get thrown into a prison camp or executed, they liked to shoot you in the back of the neck. That was the favorite Soviet means of execution. If you didn't, you would get a pension and a low standard of living, but you would get a pension. But a, a very low standard yes. of living. <laughs> yes, yes, a low, yeah, a very low standard of living. I hear the term oligarchy used when referring to Russia now. Yes. How does their government work in comparison to ours? It is a authoritarian government with Vladimir Putin calling all the shots. So in 2004, 2005, he abolished the election of governors. There are 88 different provinces, and they used to have elected governors between 1991 and 2004, now he appoints them. Putin directs the economy. It's not an open market economy where he enriches the people around him. There's plenty of no-bid contracts awarded to the people in Putin's circle that he trusts. So the oligarchs just refer to these very rich businessmen in Russia surrounding mm -hmm. Putin. It's not a uh, it's not the the traditional understanding of the term oligarchy traditionally just meant government by a group of people. It's the term used for the wealthy people surrounding Putin in Russia, including himself. <laughs>
he's almost certainly enriched himself, but the money is tracked through so many shell corporations that it's difficult to understand. Okay. I don't know if this is worthwhile, but I am just finishing up a biography of Putin, and I just finished a under three page segment that I think sums up what both government, justice, and the economy are like in Russia. Is it worth reading out loud? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. One man who did, who challenged the system, Sergei Magnitsky, died in a cell in the Matroskaya Tashina prison in Moscow on November 16, 2009. He had transferred there for emergency medical treatment for pancreatitis and cholecystitis, whatever the fuck that is. He had already been in prison for almost a year, the maximum he could be held without a trial, on charges involving a massive tax fraud that he had uncovered and reported to the authorities. So he reported the fraud and then was imprisoned. Instead of taking the man to the prison's hospital, eight guards took him to an isolation cell, handcuffed him, and beat him with batons. He was only 37, an auditor so prepossessing that no one could mistake him for a radical threatening Putin system. He represented the post-Soviet generation that had come of age in the new Russia, highly educated and professional, a father of two who believed in the dictatorship of law that Putin promised, as well as the end of legal nihilism that Dmitry Medvedev, uh, who was the second subordinate ruler under Putin, had promised. After his arrest in 2008, he was sure the law would ultimately protect him. Instead, he spent week after week transferred from dirty cell to dirty cell, allowed to see his wife and mother only once while in detention. He kept a meticulous diary of the abuses he experienced, as well as the steady decline of his health. To pass time, he read Shakespeare, Shakespeare's tragedies. His treatment in prison, as finally his death, might soon be forgotten, as had so many others in Russia's horned judicial system, where 5,000 prisoners died that year. But Magnitsky had worked for a powerful tra- patron, William Broder, once Russia's most foreign, prominent foreign investor. Broder, who's an American, had been an early cheerleader for Putin's presidency, believing in the economic reforms he had pledged, but by then he had become one one of its most embittered foes. Uh, I'll skip a little of this. Broder had amassed a powerful fo- a fortune investing shares in Russian corporations and then using his shareholder stakes to lobby for good corporate governance and transparency. In 2005, however, he was unexpectedly turned away at the airport in Moscow, his visa revoked as a matter of national security. Broder's aggressive investment strategy had crossed some line, perhaps involving Gazprom, the largest gas, natural gas company in Russia, or something I can't pronounce, both with close ties to Putin, but he would never know for sure which one. He initially hoped his deportation was a mistake that he would that would be promptly sorted out. He appealed to the men he believed were his allies in the Kremlin, but by 2007, prosecutors had turned their attention to his company's office in Moscow, and Broder quietly began divesting the assets of his investment fund, Hermitage Capital, and moving them to London. That June, two dozen officers from Russia's interior ministry raided Hermitage's office in Moscow and seized the company's corporate records, the certificates and stamps for the holding companies that made up its portfolios. By the end of the year, three of the companies had mysteriously been registered re-registered under new owners, all of them convicted criminals. These owners then applied for $230 million in tax refunds, which were granted on a single day in December. William Broder turned to a law firm in Moscow, Firestone Duncan, to figure out what had happened. The accountant who untangled this scheme was Sergei Magnitsky, the man who was killed in prison. He testified before the state's investigative committee, identifying the interior ministry officers, judges, and tax inspectors who had orchestrated the elaborate theft of the company's seals and the subsequent tax fraud. The ministry ordered an investigation into the theft and assigned as the lead investigator the police major who Madnitsky had had accused of orchestrating it, Artem Kuznetsov. 
So in other words, he said to the police, hey, investigate this uh, guy Kuznetsov. And then Kuznetsov was appointed as the investigator. <laughs> Magnitsky <laughs> was then arrested 18 days later. Magnitsky's death deeply shocked Russia's elite. They had long been inured to the harsh measures used against political activists and wayward businessmen, but Magnitsky was neither. Even if Broder po uh, posed a threat to someone's powerful interests, Magnitsky was clearly a collateral victim. His death exposed a sweeping web of, of abuse and lies about the case he investigated, his arrest and detention, his failure to treat his deteriorating health, the final beating that killed him. Dmitry Medvedev, this Russia's second in command, too, seemed shocked. A few cases illustrated as well the legal nihilism that he believed was stifling Russia's economic future. He ordered the prosecutor general to investigate and formed a working group to review the case independently, appointing prominent rights activists whom Putin had increasingly marginalized. In December, Medvedev dismissed 20 officials of the prison service, though most came from faraway regions. Only one had any connection to Magnitsky's treatment and detention. Meanwhile, M William Broder poured his resources into tracing the proceeds from the $230 million in tax receipts. The lead investigator had purchased two apartments worth more than $2 million, registered in his parents' names, as well as a Mercedes, a Range Rover, and a Land Rover, each worth many more times than his annual salary at $10,200. <laughs> the women in the tax office who had approved the rebates had a, a state in Moscow, a seaside villa in Dubai, and an $11 million in cash and offshore accounts in her husband's names. According to William Broder's investigation, the bureaucrats involved lived so far beyond their official means, it was clear that the embezzlement uh, from William Broder's fund had been replicated in hundreds, perhaps thousands of cases. Magnitsky had revealed not just the corrupt acts of a few officials, but the corruption of the entire system. For Medvedev, coming as it did uh, only months after his Russia forward exhortations, the case could have been an opportunity to set off an innocent accountant, could have set an example by punishing those involved in the embezzlement and death of an innocent accountant. The initial investigation, however, dragged on in silence, even as Broder made the case an international cause, petitioning the U.S. Congress and parliaments in Europe to impose sanctions on 60 people who had been involved. On the eve of the first anniversary of Magnitsky's death, the prosecutor's office at last announced the conclusion of its investigation. And it was as Kafka-esque as anything Medvedev had invaded against. Magnitsky, the prosecutors announced triumphantly, had masterminded the embezzlement he himself had investigated. One more paragraph. It took nearly two years for the working group Medvedev had commissioned to prevent its, present its final report. Its principal authors did so at a meeting with Medvedev in the Kremlin, concluding that his arrest had been unlawful, his death a crime, the investigation a cover-up, and the court's willing collaborators. Medvedev acknowledged in the meeting that crimes had been committed, but he was powerless to do anything about it. The next day, Russia's Ministry of Internal Affairs, ostensibly responsible to him as president and commander-in-chief, dismissed the group's report as irrelevant. Then the prosecutor's office announced after a thorough investigation it would reopen the criminal case against Magnitsky, even though he was dead, and charge him with tax fraud. Not even during the worst show trials of, of the great terror that Stalin orchestrated in the 1930s had the authorities put a dead man on trial. They would even call his mother to testify in court. And that is what Putin's Russia is like. <laughs> you speak up too loudly, you're getting killed or imprisoned. Yep, yep, yep. You denounce economic or legal corruption and you go to jail. Oh, that's scary. Yes. Well, that's why I'm not a big fan of powerful governments. <laughs> <laughs> it can go very badly for a long time. Even if we complain about the United States, remember that all these formerly communist authoritarian countries, China, Russia, and so on, are much, much worse. What would you like to add, Dalton? 
fuck communism, fuck Karl Marx. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't. Yep. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it would feel like the world would be much better off if that man was never born. Yep. Terrible things were done in his name in the 20th century. Tens of millions of people were murdered in Russia and China. And to say nothing of the continuing sorrows of North Korea. <sighs> yeah, that's a weird one where the United States government loves to talk about going into countries in the Middle East because all this horrible stuff is happening. And so, Well, what about North Korea? And not that I support invading North Korea necessarily, but it is interesting how we pick and choose where to go and why. North Korea has a huge army and nuclear weapons. Many of them are pointed at the enormous city of Seoul with more than 10 million people just 30 miles south of the border who would suffer hugely in any war. But do you think, I mean, if North Korea did something like that, they would, the government would have to know that they're basically committing suicide. Oh, yes. That would be, um, so they won't. So it's unfortunate that they're a rogue state with nuclear weapons, but there is certainly not a viable military solution. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, does that about cover what we want to talk about with communism? Yeah. It sucks. It shouldn't be put into practice. <laughs> we need to learn from history. There's not any good example of a formerly communist country transitioning to a open democratic capitalist country. Yeah, that transition seems to be very difficult. Yes. The Baltic countries are Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are partial example, but they were always occupied by Soviet Russia. It wasn't it wasn't their idea in the first place. Yeah. Thanks for listening this week. Yeah. Thank you guys. I hope you learned something. I know I did. This is one of the many subjects Nick is very knowledgeable about. Oh stop, stop. And I love but how how you. much I love how he hates commies as much as I do. <laughs> it's like a, a bonding moment for us. Right. Right. And do you have a recommendation for the week? Do I? Hmm. I don't think I do. Do you? Yeah, the book Animal Farm. I listened to it yeah. on audio, audiobook or Audible. If uh, you don't have a lot of time to read and you want to learn stuff, Audible is a great resource because if you buy one book and make an account, they give you credits. I have like probably ten books that I didn't pay a single dime for. I bought one. I bought The Road. That was my first book that I bought. Honestly, The Road is overrated. I agree. I agree. <laughs> it's overrated. I listened to it and I was like, "That's it. All right. Well." I agree. And and then once I bought that book and just kept my account, they kept giving me credits over time, and I I got six books out of it after only buying one really cheap book. So check out Audible. They're great. But the book Animal Farm, it's a great book. It's it's short. It's only about three hours on the audio version. And it's a great insight to just human nature and politics. And it's very interesting. It's a very a thought-provoking yeah. book. If you don't know about it, it's basically just a retelling of the Russian Revolution and the first 30 or so years of the Soviet Union, except with animals. Yeah, so... <laughs> After listening to this episode, if you haven't read or listened to that book, yeah. I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's great. It's a fast, interesting read. Or listen. Yeah. Good. Oh. Thank you, guys. That's yeah. all the same. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Remember, go to Apple Podcasts and give us a good rating so that others can like us. If you like what you heard, or even if you didn't, give us a good rating anyway. Yeah, and share, share us on social media. Give us a shout-out. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Dalton. Yeah, thank you, Nick.